Thank you, uh, Dennis and Archna oh, and Sages sorry. for the uh, opportunity um, to talk to you about patient selection and prehabilitation and for ventral hernia. I do have a list of disclosures, mainly uh, hernia related companies, but I won't be talking about specific products during this talk. So uh, broken into patient selection, I think it brings up some issues uh, and evolution of our thinking over the last couple of decades. And then I'll talk about some specifics of prehabilitation. Um, but I really think we're going through this evolution in the 21st century of thinking uh, from traditionally 20th century thinking. When I started uh, medicine and surgery, it was the doctor that decided uh, the concept of patient-centered care and, and patient selection and decision process really wasn't very robust at that time. And for the past 13 years, I've been functioning in a model where we tried to understand patient-centered care and work in teams and include the patient in the decision process. But I have to admit, I was fairly naive as I learned through that, what that process means. Because you know, at first, we thought, oh, we should let the patient decide, too. And uh, that's not always the best way to do it either because the patient doesn't have all the information. They come in with various beliefs and factors that sometimes don't allow them to make a good decision for themselves. And so we're kind of evolving and, and growing in our understanding. Certainly, we have limitations from the insurance company about patient selection, and I think that's not the best solution. We've tried, toward the end of the 20th century, evidence-based medicine to determine patient selection, and, and I, I think we're all seeing the limitations of the reductionist science-generated evidence, and uh, for some countries that do this uh, through the government, like the UK, they found serious flaws in trying to apply evidence-based medicine from reductionist science. And I think what we're learning is a real patient-centered shared decision process is what we're evolving to, and that's not a one moment in time. It's a relationship with patients, it's getting to know their goals and fears, it's understanding all the options. It's gaining evidence from actual patient care, not just reductionist science-generated evidence. And, and it really is coming to the point where we're understanding what we're, not, what we're not wanting is just patients to be compliant. We're wanting engagement, engagement from the patient, family, support system, us as physicians, and our clinical team. And that's, that's kind of an evolution and process. We've tried to do it, like I said, for over a decade and built a multidisciplinary hernia team around the patient, included the patient, and, and we've learned a lot. And I'm gonna talk about kind of the science behind uh, com complex systems and biologic variability because as was mentioned, and you'll hear this theme I'm sure today, it's not just a hernia, it's partly because it's not just one patient or one type of patient. We have incredible biologic variability that we need to deal with. And when we talk about implementing prehabilitation or multimodal pain management or enhanced recovery, and they're really all the same concept. We're trying to improve our process of care so we can improve the value of care. But when we see a list like this and all these different things we're trying to implement, it begins to, uh, in, in that biologic variability, you begin to understand how incomplete the science that we function under is to try to figure this out. Reduction of science tools like prospective randomized control trials attempt to pull out one factor and one outcome measure and try to see a cause and effect relationship, prove or disprove the hypothesis. And in reality, is system science and data science really shows us that all those factors that interrelate with each other and are constantly changing, we need to measure all of them, not try to pull out one and isolate it. And all those outcomes measures that would measure value, not just one primary outcome measure. We want to see the correlations between these factors and groups of factors and the outcomes that really matter to us and our patients. And, and that's a science that's very robust. In reduction of science, there's three assumptions that have to be met. You have to have the ability to control all variables, nothing can change, and whatever's produced should be generalizable to all local environments, and that's just not the real world that we live in. And so the system science and data science paradigm is really designed for constant change in biologic variability, and it really is about what we really do in our real world in patients. And this is a book written by a physician a few years ago, and, and one of the main themes of the book is we do care for patients, but we should also be learning from that care through data and science. And every time we take care for a patient, we should be able to learn from it, and we should have a system in place. 
And the concept of the linear model of innovation and, and linear um, statistics, uh, I'll, I'll refer you to a story that came out of a book by Todd Rose called The End of Average. And this is from the Air Force, where um, for several years, they continue to have airplanes crashing regularly, daily. And uh, this is not in conflict, this is just training. And they thought at first it would be pilot error or it would be mechanical failure, and it took them years to figure out. But what they had done when they launched the Air Force program, they took over 120 biometric measurements of all the pilots, waist circumference, arm length, head circumference, and they built the perfect cockpit the perfect cockpit that would be the average of all the pilots. The problem was that perfect cockpit didn't fit any of the pilots because they weren't the average. And what they found, the great majority of crashes was because of the pilot interacting with a cockpit that was not designed well for their body. And that's kind of what we've been doing with reduction of science in healthcare. We try to get the average from all the patients in, in prospective randomized controlled trials, and it doesn't fit the individual patients or local environment. So why did we perceive that it was working all through the 20th century and now it, it seems that it's not working as well? Well, about 20 years ago, a couple of groups of astrophysicists discovered that the universe is actually accelerating in its expansion. So the pace of change in our world is increasing. We see that in waves of innovation. We're seeing faster and faster pace of change and that's really what's helping to reveal the incompleteness of the scientific paradigm that we've been functioning under, and we see it in our organizations because if we have organizations designed with a reduction of science model and we get increasing pace of change, what we'll have is increasing fragmentation. More and more departments with less and less resources fighting for the same pool of resources. And what it also does predictably is significantly increase the bureaucracy and the increase of need for administrators uh, compared to the people who actually do the work. And, uh, of course, what this leads to is more and more inefficiency and waste. And those bureaucracies, those administrators just want things to be simple. They want us to do one size fits all uniform standards for our patient care, and we know that won't work. And when I went to the textbook of standards, uh, introduction to standards and standardization, I, I actually found out that uniformity is not the definition of standardization, it's optimal variety. And so putting a scientific paradigm in place that allows us to understand the optimal variety of treatments for patient groups. Again, another theme that I think we'll see more and more in our uh, ability to try to learn and improve. And something that I think is really underappreciated, uh, I know the administrators in the hospitals are under massive regulations, but as surgeons, as physicians, we're not regulated. We have the legal authority to try to make positive implement implementation of process improvements for our patients look at our results, learn from them, and apply that in a feedback loop. But with that authority, there's a lot of responsibility. Uh, there's a peer-reviewed published international guideline uh, for ventral hernias that said, ventral hernia patients are way too complex. We need to go beyond the reduction of science tools. We need to use system science and, and data science tools. So this is now published in a peer-reviewed peer uh, format. And our U.S. healthcare laws have backed this for a long time. I didn't know this until a few years ago. But in the HIPAA law, there's an exclusion that if you do care coordination and quality improvement activities, you're exempt from HIPAA. And it's now through the more laws that have been developed. It's absolutely clear, and the government has, has weighed in on this, that it's not appropriate to go through IRB. But we need to learn through the system science and data science what we're measuring and learn to improve how we measure because really we want, to we want to improve the value of care we're providing, but to do that we'll have to measure the value of care we're, we're providing. And that means we need cost data and that's certainly the biggest challenge, but we can do better with that and we can work with our hospitals to try to get more accurate cost data, but outcomes that, that measure value also include patient perspective outcomes and so we need to get better and better at measurement. Now, I've been at the University of Tennessee for over a year, and we're actually developing policy statements so that people can see that, that this is appropriate. Human subjects research and traditional experimenting, absolutely, IRB is very critical to that, and there's an appropriate path to do that. But if you're doing real-world uh, assessment of your outcomes and you're using that information to try to improve in a continuous improvement model, then it's inappropriate to go through IRB, and we need to not just clarify that, but promote that, that we should be doing that as part of our care. So implementing prehabilitation into your, your 
normal care should be measured, and we, but we should also do that as part of the attempt to improve outcomes. And I think we're gaining more and more evidence of what kinds of things we can be doing. Uh, but CQI, clinical quality improvement, and, and system science and data science is really a, a local sport and it's a team sport. So we should all be doing this in our own environment first and learning from each other. We heard about smoking cessation. That's got some good evidence and we've gotten more and more um, evidence to, to do that. But maybe there's other things our patients should uh, not do and stop doing prior to surgery. In, in the last few years, the opioid epidemic has become a major issue. Uh, but there's not a lot of evidence as to what we should do in preparation for surgery with a patient who's on opioids. And current recommendations pretty much say they should just stay on their dosage. But we've looked at our patient group, and for our AWR repair patients, almost half of them come in already taking opioids for one problem or another, sometimes related to the hernia, sometimes not. And we looked at the results. We found patients who were taking opioids had longer lengths of stays, required more uh, opioids, not surprisingly, but also mortality was much higher. And so maybe we should be looking at opioid cessation as well. Some other areas that we're pretty uh, comfortable about the evidence, uh, weight loss, knowing we want to optimize our patients in terms of their weight, we've heard about that. Nutritional optimization, both chronically as part of a healthy weight loss program, but also in the short term with carbohydrates. There's more and more evidence for that. And these uh, slides come right from the patient education material that we give to the patients and we talk with the patients about. Clearly medical optimization, diabetes is a common one and, and uh, has been well studied. Other things like cardi uh, cardiac and pulmonary conditions. We want to work with our medical colleagues, primary care physicians, and help to optimize the, any medical conditions in preparation for surgery. And I'm gonna highlight a couple areas that aren't as well uh, studied or described, and that is just get, getting a patient in better shape, giving them more endurance and strength, getting them in an exercise program. This is a huge stress to the body, and if they come in and they're not in very good shape, it's, it's gonna be much worse, it's like sending somebody out to run a marathon without training, it's not very pretty. And so there is growing evidence, relationship between things like just climbing a couple flights of stairs, if a patient can do that, or how long it takes to do that, or a six minute walk test. We're seeing that can predict outcomes after major surgery. This was a recent paper that was published, and it basically said that timing a, a patient preoperatively, how long it takes them to climb stairs, was a better predictor of outcomes than the entire NISQIP calculator, risk calculator. So just one measurement that's pretty simple could be much more predictive, and, and this is improving measurement. That's part of system science and data science is learning, not just improving the process to improve the outcomes, but improving our measurement and learning how we can get better at measuring things so it gives us better insight through data and analytics to improve outcomes. There's the concept of frailty, and you know, if you can't, if a patient can't walk by themselves from the waiting room into the, the exam room, then that's probably not a good patient to do a major surgery on. And the, the frailty indexes are pretty simple, but they're many, and this is good. We should be doing different things in different local environments. This is just a list of different ways to measure frailty preoperatively. There's even rat studies, animal studies, to kind of back this up. We're almost kind of going um, non-linear in our ability to understand this, but this is a rat study that showed uh, prior to a surgical intervention, if the rat could do exercise, they're gonna have better uh, outcomes, especially in, in the context in this study was, if it was an older rat, they had better cognitive outcomes. I'm not sure how they measured the cognitive uh, measurement, but they did, and it showed that it was an improvement if they had exercise preoperatively. And another area that we've been really getting into in the last five years is the psychosocial emotional state of the patient preoperatively, something that's not very, um, significantly looked at in an acute surgical environment, but in other area, areas of healthcare, this is a lot of deep research into this, and there's growing evidence that the patient's emotional state preoperatively has a major impact on our outcomes. And it hit me, my aha moment in this was about a year ago, I was at a conference in England, and two talks were given, one by an anesthesiologist and one by a physical trainer, and they talked about all the science and the sports psychology and the research and the effort that they put into preparing an athlete for an athletic event that's a, a, 
that's an entertainment. And I'm thinking, wow, we don't do hardly any of this for our patients for a surgical event that may affect their life for the rest of their life. And, and so we have tried to look at that factor, the emotional state of the patient, for a few years. We use nonlinear analytics, which is factor analysis, and we get weighted correlations. How much does this factor impact this outcome or this set of outcomes in a positive way or a negative way? And so it's up to one, positive one means it's highly correlated, negative one it's, it's highly negatively correlated with its outcomes. And the outcomes we looked at were complications, bad outcomes. And we saw both in laparoscopic ventral hernia repair and in abdominal wall re reconstruction, the number one modifiable factor that predicted bad outcomes was a poor emotional state in our patient. And so the emotional state was something we could modify potentially with cognitive therapy. And so we worked with social scientists, social workers. We developed a measurement tool and we tried to identify what are the cognitive problems or issues that patients are dealing with preoperatively and begin the process in those patients that have some signs of cognitive problems, emotional problems, that we get them into focused cognitive therapy, sometimes many months. We've had a few patients that's taken years, but we're seeing results get better uh, through this kind of a modification. So we are trying to mature our efforts in prehabilitation, and it's not a one static, one size fits all protocol. It's catered just different subpopulations of patients. Uh, eventually, with this kind of data science, we can begin to get predictive algorithms. Those, those weighted factor analysis, those weighted correlations can be put into algorithms where we can identify the patients that are at risk for, it'll never be perfect, but as you continuously update an algorithm, it gets better and better at predicting. We'll be able to predict which patients are at risk for developing chronic pain or recurrence after a hernia repair, or which patients are most likely to achieve the goals that they set preoperatively, and then continue to do better at stopping things that may be harmful to them, modifying things that may lead to worse results, and then continue to improve our measurements of these factors. And I'll just give you one brief thing. We can also continuously update what we're measuring and, and help patients understand where they are in a group of other patients that have gone before them, because if we just give them averages, and this is about a long-acting local anesthetic block, and we would normally tell them what the evidence showed us from the reduction of science pre-market study. We'd say, oh, the, your block should last 72 hours. And if it didn't last 72 hours, they thought something was wrong. Or if it lasted longer than 72 hours, they thought something was wrong. So we asked 25 patients, how long did your block last? And this is the result. And you can see 72 hours was only four patients. And three patients didn't perceive that it worked at all and several patients that lasted more than five days. So when you get real evidence, you can help a patient understand where they might fit in and that if it isn't exactly 72 hours, it's okay. It doesn't mean something's wrong. So having more evidence, that can help decrease the fear of a patient, help them uh, not have a bad outcome. So I'd like to summarize with a couple of case studies. This is a patient with a very complex hernia. We did not have prehabilitation in place. We operated did an abdominal wall reconstruction. He, um, he did okay, he was in the hospital a couple weeks, he had a chronic wound complication, he had recurrence. Um, but by then, we had implemented a lot of these processes. His second abdominal wall reconstruction, he was in the hospital three days and he had a, a very good result. This is a lady who had a tram flap disaster, mesh complication, five operations. She had no rectus muscle, no anterior fascia, no posterior fascia. We did prehabilitation, got her ready, did multimodal pain management, enhanced recovery. She was in the hospital one day, and that's how she looks after a six-hour operation. However, we still need to improve. This is a recent case, 11 operations, loss of domain. We thought we had done a good job of prehabilitation. We thought he was in good shape. He's a farmer from Missouri. He was in the hospital for almost a month. He had wound complications. He was on the ventilator for about a week and a half. Uh, he's doing better now, but we, we certainly have room for improvement. So I'll conclude with this uh, syst uh, systematic review on surgical innovation, the ability to implement process improvement, new ideas, and the concepts of the ethical imperative we have to do this and do this well. And it's really about developing a learning model, what, uh, what that designing care book talks about. And, and the interesting thing here is, to do that well, we need to change our thinking and our environment. And it says, what we need is an environment where learning is perceived as an ethical imperative 
and this requires a culture characterized by self-reflection, vulnerability, and the willingness to change. Not really the 20th century healthcare we live in, but I hope this is a part of the 21st century. And that's where we need to understand how to work in teams, build systems around improvement, and using tools from systems and data science like CQI and nonlinear analytics, engaging the patient and family, not making them comply, and then most importantly, measuring our outcomes that measure value and learning from them. So instead of thinking that our patients are machines, like what came out of the reduction of science here, we need to understand constant change in biologic variability and, and apply a science that is built for that. And we can't change the fact that our universe is accelerating faster and faster, but we can le learn these principles to apply to us and our patients, and we can get better and better and better value over time. I want to thank you very much.